Hi, welcome to the course to learn JUnit framework and specifically JUnit 5. If you have ever written code, you would have definitely tested it or at least parts of it. Testing is an essential part of your development lifecycle. So you code a feature and you test it immediately. And while you test the feature, you also ensure any existing features are not negatively affected. And that is just the beginning. What happens when you move your code out of your machine and merge it with a larger code base? Something must test your code and ensure that it delivers the value that it is supposed to. And most importantly, it doesn't break anything. So basically, you need a tool to test your code. There are a few frameworks that help programmers perform testing. And among them, JUnit is by far the most widely used. JUnit by itself doesn't do any testing. It, however, provides a framework for developers to implement testing in a very efficient manner. You can test specific scenarios, you can run tests based on a specific condition, you can enable tests, disable tests, you can run them repeatedly, and you can run against specific parameters. There's a whole host of tests that you can run and ensure that your application delivers the value that it is meant to and against each condition that it gets subjected to. That is the purpose of testing and JUnit helps us achieve it. So without further ado, let's start learning JUnit. JUnit is a testing framework for Java based applications. The applications can be based only on core Java or they could also be API based applications. JUnit is probably one of the most widely used frameworks used for unit testing. There are earlier versions of JUnit as well, like JUnit 3 and JUnit 4, and these have been widely used in the programming community and also in real enterprise projects. JUnit 5 is the latest version of JUnit, and while supporting the earlier versions of Java, it has also adapted Java 8 style of coding using streams, functional interfaces, and lambda expressions. It has also added new ways of testing like repeated testing, newer ways of conditional testing and many many more. But before we really dig deep into the coding part of it, let's first understand a bit of its architecture. The overall JUnit 5 architecture comprises three components. There is the basic JUnit platform that is used to run and execute tests. Any IDE be it Eclipse or IntelliJ or any other must extend this platform and build their extensions on top of it. Next, there is a newer component called JUnit Jupyter. This provides newer extension models for writing tests that support versions of Java 8 and above. There were newer coding styles and libraries as I told earlier. It included streams, functional programming, lambdas, and more. The Jupyter component supports all of them. Lastly, though JUnit 5 must support the newer ways of testing, it must also be reliably backward compatible. The component that does this is called JUnit Vintage. As we move along the course, we will see each one of these components in great detail and how they all work together to create great test cases. Thank you. Welcome back. In this lecture, we will be setting up our environment so that when we write test cases, we can relate to a common setup in case any troubleshooting is required. First, about the Java version. We write all our test cases on Java 11 as that has LTS or long term support and in my experience is found to be extremely stable. There is Java 17 as well that has LTS, you could try that as well. None of the test cases written in this course would behave any differently between the two versions. You can install Java from the Oracle website or the OpenJDK platforms like Amazon Coreto. It's fairly simple. For Amazon's OpenJDK or Oracle JDK, open any of the links given here. Select the download as per your operating system, whether it is Windows or Mac or Linux. Once you have installed Java, the next step is to set up an IDE. Download Eclipse from this link here. Make sure that you download the Eclipse for Enterprise Java and Web Developers. It would be a zip file again, extract it to your preferred location. Once done, open Eclipse, give a workspace path at the prompt. Once Eclipse is open, go to Window, search for Installed JRE. Here, 
give the path to the JDK that you just installed. In case you see a warning for the compiler version, just click on the link for compiler and change the level to version 11. That's it. If you have been able to do all the steps till now successfully, your setup is similar to what we work on during the rest of the course. See you in the next lecture. Thank you. Welcome back. In this section, you will create your first JUnit 5 test case. There are multiple ways you can create a project to write tests. The first and the simplest is by creating a Java project in Eclipse. You can just give it a name called JUnit tests or anything else you want and start creating test cases under it. The second way is probably the more standard way using a build tool like Maven or Gradle that is used in a majority of enterprises. In the next lecture, you will see the simpler version of it. However, the rest of the course, you will use Maven as the build tool. In this lecture, you will be creating test cases using a custom folder structure, that is, without using a standard tool like Maven or Gradle. In our Eclipse IDE, let's create a new Java project and call it JUnit Tests. The source or the SRC folder is typically where you would have your application against which you would write test cases. We then create a test folder and create a JUnit test case. Here you can select the version of JUnit that you are going to work with. If you change your selection of the platform between JUnit Jupyter, JUnit 4 and 3, you see some differences in the annotations used. In this course, we use JUnit Jupyter. Let's leave it there, give our class a name and finish. Eclipse might prompt you about importing JUnit 5 library. Accept it and proceed. In case it is unable to import like mine here, you will see compile errors and here is what you must do to fix it. Right click on the project, configure build path and then under libraries, click on class path, add library, select JUnit, select JUnit 5 as the version and then finish. Now your compiler errors should go away. Now back to our class, we write all our test cases here. The first test case is already written by the IDE. There are a few things to observe here. There is an annotation called at the rate test. This is a lifecycle annotation that indicates that this is a test method that the JUnit platform must execute. And the void test. So the test is a method name. It can be anything, but it should not be private and it should also not be static. Then the body of the method. So here a fail method is implemented. So this is a method in JUnit that forces a failure. To run all this, all you need to do is right click on the test case class and run as JUnit test. And then you see that the test case is run. The red bar indicates that it is a failed test case, obviously because the failure is forced here by the dummy test case. Using Maven or Gradle is the most preferred method and also an enterprise standard in most companies. So we will be using that hereafter. The advantage of Maven is in first enforcing certain standards. Some may say it is a bit opinionated, but over time this opinionated design has proven that these standards are here to stay. They are battle tested in thousands of applications. Addition of plugins to view the test results and also to perform certain actions is another advantage that Maven brings with it. It also provides seamless integration with CI CD pipelines. Now back to our IDE, let's create a Java project using Maven. Right click, click on new, other, type Maven. Select the Maven project Check on Create Simple Project Skip Archetype option Choose the Workspace folder Give Group ID as com.ilearn.junit Artifact as Arithmetic Calculator So in this course, we will be creating an arithmetic calculator 
and then work on creating JUnit test cases on it. Leave the rest as default values and finish. You should now see the project is created in your workspace. If it is your first time using Maven, it may take a minute or so to download dependencies. Once the Maven process is complete, you see some folders already created for you by Maven. SRC main Java is for the source code. SRC test Java is for the test cases, SRC main resources or the SRC test resources are for any resource files your application might need. By default, Maven takes Java 5 as the default. In our case, we need Java 8 and above. So open the bomb.xml file and add the details given in the resources section of this lecture. Essentially, we are asking Maven to add JUnit Jupyter libraries to the project. Also, we have asked Maven to update its Java version to 11. Once done, let's first create the calculator application in the src main Java folder. So as I said earlier, this is the application on which we will be writing our JUnit test cases. We have already written a sample application so that we can focus more on the JUnit part. It just does basic arithmetic operations like add, subtract, multiply and divide and modulus. Next, let's create the JUnit test cases. For that, we use the src test java folder. Here, right click and create a new JUnit test. Give a package name and for simplicity, I have kept it the same as the application. Give a name to it, say calculator test and then click on finish. You see a simple test case being created. And you can run this test case by right clicking the test class and run as JUnit test. It fails obviously because of the forced failure. And now that's it for this lecture. From the next lecture onwards, we will work with the Maven project and explore more about writing JUnit test cases. Thank you. Welcome back. In this lecture, we go through some concepts before diving into the code. A test when it runs actually goes through some lifecycle phases. Each phase is managed using Java annotations by the JUnit 5 framework. The first phase is called the setup phase. This is managed by annotations before all and before each. Typically actions such as infrastructure setup such as creating file or database connections is performed during this phase. The second phase is the execution phase. This is managed by annotations at the rate test, at repeated test, at conditional test and a few more and they actually do the job of running a test case. The last phase is called the cleanup phase and this is managed by annotations after all and after each. Typically cleanup activities are performed here. So any pending file or database connections are closed here. Let's see each one of these annotations in action in the coming lectures. Thank you. Welcome back. Assertions in JUnit are methods that are used to perform the testing. They are used to compare the actual value with the expected value. All assertion methods in JUnit are from the class or .junit.jupyter.api.assertions. Now if you open the source code of that class, you see many methods that it has for testing. You can see a quick glance at the methods in the outline view in Eclipse IDE. You see there is a fail method at the very top of the list. Then there are other methods for assert like assert true, assert false, assert equals, not equals and so many more. You see various forms of each type of assert or fail method. That's compile time polymorphism in action right here. Among the many, you will see some very important and most frequently used assertions in this section. So let's dive in. Let's look at some simple assertions first. It is always a good practice to create a separate method to test each type of assertion. Let me first delete the default test that is created by the IDE for forcing a failure. And then let's create a method for checking addition. I'll call this method as 
test addition success. And since this is a test method that actually runs a test case, we must associate it with an annotation at the rate test. Also, test methods must not return anything and they must not be private and they should also not be static. This is something that has already been told in a previous lecture. And then as the body of the method, we use assert equals. And it takes values 3, comma calculator dot add 1, comma 2. So assert equals as the name suggests, it validates whether the expected value is the same as the actual result. Now save it and run the test case. See that it indicates that the test has passed with a green bar. Now very similar to that, let's test the negative condition as well. So the method name we can give is test underscore addition underscore failure. So here the calculator dot add method returns one, but the expected is zero, but that is in the negative scenario. So the assert not equals assertion can be used here. So write assert not equals zero comma calculator dot add one comma zero. And obviously addition will not return a zero value. So the assert not equals succeeds. You can check for true or false as well using the assert true or the assert false assertion. And let's use a method test underscore true response. Assert true. Now let's compare the calculator dot multiply result. So calculator dot multiply 3 comma 6 and let's compare it to 18. And the assert true method, it expects a boolean. It is a success if the expression evaluates to a boolean true and it evaluates to a false if the expression evaluates to false value. Let's just run it and see. Now all our test cases have passed. So that's very good. Let's move on to the next lecture where you see a few more simple assertions. Welcome back. In this lecture, we see a couple more important assertions, assert null and assert throws. With assert null, we check for a null response. Let's use the divide operation to do this check. Going to the calculator application, we see that the divide operation returns a null value if the divisor is zero. So let's test that. Let's create a method in our JUnit test class called test underscore addition null response and assert null calculator dot divide one comma zero. Let's run it and check. Another important test is checking for exceptions. This is especially true in case of business exceptions that must be thrown in case a scenario fails. So it's very important that these exceptions are indeed thrown. So we have to test for these. So let's create a method void test underscore exceptions. Now, in order to test exceptions, we use the assert throws method. It expects an exception class and an executable. An executable is a functional interface that has one abstract method called execute. It does not take any input parameters and it does not return any specific data type. In our case, we use the add method of the calculator class and pass null values to it and check whether the method indeed throws a null pointer exception. So let's write assert throws null pointer exception dot class comma and the lambda expression for the functional interface. So it does not take any arguments and we write calculator dot add null comma null. That's it. Now run this test and check whether it's a success. Until now, you have written assertions in test cases for scalar types. In this lecture, you will learn how to write assertions for arrays and iterables such as lists and sets. Let me create a separate class for checking these. Create a new JUnit test class called arrays and iterables test. Now let's create a method in it and call it test underscore array underscore compare. And let's annotate it with at the rate test. Now up until now we've just been comparing integers. For a change, let's compare uh, strings. So string array of S1 is, it takes two strings, hello and junit5. And string array of S2 is also the same, hello junit5. 
and you can just compare the two strings. I said array equals s1 comma s2. Now running the test will do a deep comparison of each element in the array and return the result. Now try changing one of them and run again. You can see the result as a failure. Now similar to arrays, you can also test iterables such as lists or sets. So let's create a new method void test underscore iterables. And let's create two lists. The list of integer il1 is list dot of 1, 2 and 3. And list il2 is same, list of 1, 2 and 3. Now assert iterable equals il1 comma il2. Now running this will obviously give us a success. That was quite simple. Now let's create a set and compare it with a list. So let's create a set of integer hs1 is a new hash set of integers hs1 dot add of 1, add 2 and add 3. Now assert iterable equals hs1 and we compare it with a list il1. And now let's run this. Now this is a success as well. So basically what this tells us is that the type doesn't really matter as long as the types implement the iterable interface. The assert iterable equals compares only the values in the iterables and returns a success or a failure. Typically when we run unit tests, there will be certain steps we need to execute before each test is run. It could prepare the environment for the upcoming test. Likewise, there will be certain steps that we need to perform after the test is run like deleting any temporary files or killing some processes, etc. We use the lifecycle annotations at the rate before each and at the rate after each for these. Let's add it in the calculator test class. At the rate before each, void before underscore each, and the method body can be system.out.println prepare environment before test. Now, Let's also add the at after each method. At the rate after each is the annotation in the method void after underscore each. And the body can be as simple as system.out.println cleanup environment after test. Let's run this. You will see that the methods are run before each test and also after each test based on the corresponding annotation. You can also add some additional information to the at before each and at after each methods. JUnit provides an interface called test info for this. Now looking at the documentation for test info, it says test info is used to inject information about the current test or container into at the rate test, at repeated test, at parameterized test and so on. If a method parameter is of type test info, JUnit will supply an instance of test info corresponding to the test or container as the value for the parameter. Now don't get overwhelmed by the technical description. Let's add it actually in our tests and see what this means in practice. That ought to clear any doubts. Now for the add before each method, let's write test info as the interface and info. And in our system out parental end, we'll just write info dot get display name. And the same thing we'll add for the add after each method as well. So write test info info and the system dot out dot println will have info dot get display name now let's run all the tests once again and see what happens now you see the information about the test cases before and after which the methods are actually being run similar to the before each and after each lifecycle annotations there is a before all and after all annotation these are methods that run only once before all the tests and once after all the tests. And since they are run only once, they are static methods. Before all can be used to obtain connections to a database or maybe to file systems or probably set up connection pools before starting to test. After all, can be used to close any open connections, clean up logs, etc. Let's add them. At the rate before all, static void before underscore all let's also add the test info here 
system.out.println getting all connections and we add info.getDisplayName. Now unlike the test info in the at after each and at the read before each methods, the test info here would actually contain the test class details as the method is static. It would not contain the test method details. Now similar to at the read before all, let's also add at after all static void after underscore all test info info and let's add info dot get display name now let's run once again to verify if what we have understood is correct as you see here the before and after all is run just once the before each and after each methods continue to run after each test case you have seen that the info dot get display name method gets the name of the test class or the test method depending on the lifecycle annotation over the test method now the default name that gets printed is the name of the method itself. However, if you want, you can also give a more descriptive name to the methods that rather than just using the method name. And that can be done using the annotation at the rate display name. For example, let's add the display name annotation to the addition method at the rate display name. And let's give it a value successful addition. Also, let's add the display name annotation on the failure scenario. At the rate display name, test addition failure, and maybe also write negative scenario. Now, if you run the test cases, you will see the console shows the given custom display name and not the method name itself. Also, the JUnit display shows the same. This can help in identifying the scenarios. You can also give a more descriptive name in case of complex scenarios. Welcome back. In certain scenarios, you may want to enable specific tests and in others, you may want to disable some tests. JUnit5 gives annotations for those as well. All these conditions are in the package org.junit.jupyter.api.condition and this package is in the jar file JUnit Jupyter API version .jar. Now, just for clarity, we'll create another class and call it conditional tests. I'll also copy some basic tests that we did earlier in the calculator test class. Now coming to conditional tests, there is an annotation called at the rate enabled if environment variable. This annotation ensures that a test method on which it is annotated is run only if the given environment variable has a specific value, otherwise the method is skipped. So let's write at the rate test. Now on my system, I have an environment variable called OS and I have given it a value windows underscore 11. So let's check for it. At the rate enabled if environment variable named is OS and it should match the value windows underscore 11. Now that's the same method, the test addition success. Let's run it once and see. It now runs successfully. Now let me change the value and try. Now you see it skips the test. There is also an enabled on OS annotation that checks the type of the operating system that you are on. Let's write it. Now at the rate enabled on OS, now it already has a preset list of values that it recognizes. Let's see for OS.Linux. Now, as you see, you can enable or disable for Windows, Mac, and more. This obviously doesn't run because I am running on Windows. You can also enable or disable test methods based on specific Java versions using at the rate enabled on GRE annotation. Let me write at the rate enabled on GRE and let me check for GRE.java underscore 11. Now running these tests, you will see that only those that match a specific condition are run. If it doesn't match, it doesn't run. Just like at the rate enabled annotations, there are at the rate disabled annotations. You can probably try those as an exercise. Welcome back. You may have already noticed it. The sequence in which test methods execute is not the same sequence you have written them. 
JUnit doesn't really guarantee a specific sequence by default as each test is supposed to be self-contained and not really depend on other tests. However, if need be, you can order tests in a particular sequence if required. Now let's create another class called calculator order tests this time and use the same methods. Now how do you order them? If you want to order the tests in a particular sequence, first you need to specify at the class level that this test class uses ordering and that is done by using the annotation test method orderer. This annotation expects the ordering algorithm to be selected. We can select it by ordering annotation. Now what this means is you need to add an annotation called at the rate order on the top of each test method and give it a value. Now let's give the annotation at the rate order the value 1 for the addition success method and give random sequences to the other methods order 2, 3, 4, 5. Now the addition failure method is skipped and this is deliberate. Let's run and see what happens. Now as you see the tests are all run in the order in which we have specified. And though we have not given the order annotation for the failure method, it is not skipped. JUnit just runs it in the end. Sometimes you may want to repeat certain test scenarios such as writing to a file or calling an API repeatedly and then you may want to evaluate the behavior of your application in case multiple calls are made. Now you can also evaluate the memory and the CPU load with these tests. Let's see with an example. We'll create a separate class for this called repeated tests. Now repeated test methods can be created using the annotation at the rate repeated test. And at the rate repeated test takes a value for the number of repetitions. Let's give it a value of 20 for now. We'll create the test method. Now just like the test info interface that provides details of the test being run, there is another interface called repetition info that can be used on test methods that make use of the repeated test annotation. So let's also give repetition info rep info. A trivial use case can be something like operating on lists that is memory intensive and then evaluate the performance based on that. And to do that, let's create a list of integers. List of integer i list is equal to list dot of one two three four and five and let's also create another list of integers again and name it i square list and here we'll perform the square of the numbers in the first list and store it here let's see the effect of this on memory we'll also make use of the stream api as i list dot stream dot map for each element in the list n calculator dot multiply n comma n so this would do the square and then finally use dot collect collectors dot to list let's also use the assert iterable equals method assert iterable equals list dot of 1 4 9 16 and 25 yeah that's right comma i square list and now let's print the free memory available at the end of each repetition as told earlier. So let's write system.out.println the repetition number and that can be obtained using repinfo.getCurrentRepetition. You can also get the total number of repetitions but we already know that. And the free memory as free colon memory. Alright, save it and let's run it once and see what happens. As you can observe here, the test is run 20 times and the free memory is shown at the end of each repetition. Now this kind of test gives us good insight into various aspects of our application. Hope this was useful. Thank you. Welcome back. In this lecture, you will learn about parameterized tests. Now generally any method in Java can take parameters to perform some operation. However, we have not yet seen that so far in any of our test methods. Other than test info and repetition info types, 
that are anyways given by J unit. The reason is that there cannot be other methods that call your unit test case methods. That itself defeats the purpose of unit testing when you couple different test methods. However, with parameterized tests, you can pass parameters to your test method and you can evaluate. But before we actually dive into the code, let me show you the pom.xml file first. In order to run the parameterized tests, you need a JUnit Jupyter library. So if you open the pom.xml file and see, there is a dependency listed here. It's called JUnit Jupyter params. So without this dependency, you will not be able to run your parameterized tests. Now let's start creating the tests. We'll create a new class called parameterized tests. The test methods must be annotated with at the rate parameterized test. And then you can work with multiple sources. It is like a streaming source that passes each of its values through your method. The first method that we create, we can have at value as source annotation. Here we just pass a list of integers. We then evaluate if our calculator can do the square of the passed integer correctly. So write at the rate value source ints is equal to in curly braces 1, 2, 3. The variable name is just ints. It can be anything. Void test value source integer n. Now let's evaluate that with math.power method. Assert equals math dot power n comma 2. So that does the square. Calculator dot multiply n comma n dot double value. Now here's another variation of the assert method. So you can also give a custom message in case a test case fails. Here let's give square is incorrect. Now let's run this test once and find out if our calculator and the Java method are both returning the same values. Yeah, of course they are. You can also print a custom name. Earlier you were using at the rate display name and that was kind of a static name that does not apply to parameterized tests as the values vary. We can give an argument based name something like this. So after at the rate parameterized test annotation, give a name to it. Give it as check if index 0 is a multiple of 2. So here basically we try to check if uh, the given set of values are a multiple of 2 or not. Now the value source will have a set of ints. Let's give them as 2, 4, 6, 8 and 9. And the method as void test underscore multiple of 2 and it takes integer i and since this is a source of ints we have only one parameter to the test method on that is only one integer then we can do an assert true calculator dot modulus of i comma 2 and see if it is equal to 0 now run the test and see that the name of the test is set dynamically depending on the input now, it's not necessary to just pass only scalar data types to your parameterized tests. You can also pass complex values in CSV format. So CSV stands for comma separated value format. So CSV format supports complex values as parameters in double quotes. And each parameter in the double quotes is separated by a comma. So we can give at the rate CSV source under parameterized test and let's give the list of values as mark comma 1 so this is the first value and the second value will be satya comma 2 and the third value will be jeff comma 3 and the method test underscore csv source string name int id let's print using system dot dot print ln name comma id we can do an assert not null of name 
and then assert true id is greater than 0. Run the test and check. Now, what if you want to pass a large set of complex values and test them all in your test case? The previous annotation at the rate CSV source is good for smaller sets of data. But for larger sets of data, you can store them all in a CSV file and pass the entire file to the test case. JUnit is powerful enough to read the file and test each of the values. Now let's create a CSV file in the resources folder. Right click, select file and then name it as testfile.csv. I'll add some three values there with an integer and its square. So 2, 4, 3, 9, 4, 16. And now back into our test class at the rate parameterized test. Now we give the CSV file source annotation and give the resources value as testfile.csv. The test method is test underscore CSV file source and it takes as many number of parameters as the number of values within the double quotes in the CSV. So int number comma int square. Let's print the numbers with system.out.println number comma square and we can do an assert equals square comma calculator dot multiply number comma number. Let's run the test case once and double check. Okay, that's cool. So the second value in the CSV file is read into the square variable and it gets matched with the square calculation done by our calculator class. The result matches. Welcome back. In this lecture, you will learn how to group test cases together so that they can run as one single unit. Test cases can be nested or grouped together by using non-static inner test classes that must have the annotation at the rate nested on them. Preferably, they must also have a different display name to indicate why they are actually grouped together. Let me create a new test class called nested tests for clarity. And then I'll also copy the contents of the calculator test here. Right. Now let's say you want to group all the addition tests together. So we can create a nested class called addition test. And also we can add the annotation at the rate nested to on top of it. We can also give it a display name nested class for calculators addition functionality. Now if you run this file, notice that all the tests for addition are grouped together. The test results are however the same. The only difference is that the tests for a specific function are grouped and hence are easier to view and analyze. Welcome back. With nested test cases, you saw how to group tests within a single test class file. Now what if the tests are distributed across multiple files? In the real world scenario, this is what happens. Tests are grouped based on functionality into separate files. And in order to group them, we use a test suite. A test suite itself may not have any tests written, but its job is to run the test cases that are given to it. Let's see with an example. First, let's refactor our code a little bit. I'll create a new package under JUnit called tests. I'll then move all our test classes under this package. We'll then create a test suite in a separate package com.ilearn.junit.suites Now create a new test class called test suite for calculator in the package com.ilearn.junit.suites Assume that the test suite is meant to include only those test classes that test the calculator. We can do that by first including the annotation at the rate suite. This is what makes it a test suite. Next, we can choose what we want to include as part of this test suite with at the rate select set of annotations. There is a select package annotation using which you can select an entire package of test classes. Let's use that first and give the package name com 
ilearn.junit.test. So all the test classes must run now. Next, we can give the test suite a name using at the rate suite display name. Let's name it the calculator test suite. Now let me run it. Now as you can see, all the test classes are run from under the test suite. Now let's say you want to run only a few test classes. You can do that by using the annotation at the rate select classes. As you see, the test classes are not visible to the test suite at compile time. The reason for this is that they are all by default created without an access modifier and that makes them accessible only to the classes under the same package. If we want classes from another package to be able to access these classes, we must change them all to public. Let's do that quickly for all the test classes. Now back to our test suite. Here you can give one or more class names as other it select classes and in curly braces give calculator test dot class calculator order tests then conditional tests save it and run it once now you can see that only those classes are run which are selected in the test suite now we can create another test suite for running all other tests and name it test suite other here again give the annotation at the rate suite and give at the rate select classes and here we give all those classes that actually do not directly test the calculator for example our arrays and iterables test parameterized tests repeated tests now save it and run these as well and so that is how you can group tests using test suite Welcome back. Welcome back. So far you have created lots of tests and also seen all the results. It would really be great if you can actually publish these results rather than just have them in the ID. Maven provides a way to generate a report that is readable by everyone including those who may not really know Java or JUnit. All you need to do is add a couple of plugins in the pom.xml file. We have already done that in our XML file. There are two sections in the pom.xml, one for plugins and one for reporting. The plugin section has a Surefire plugin and a Maven site plugin. And the reporting section has a Surefire report plugin and also a Maven JXR plugin. So this is all you need in your pom.xml file for you to be able to generate a report. Plugins are basically like tools that enable Maven to do additional stuff rather than just handling transitive dependencies. With this, all you need to do is right click on the project, select run as Maven build. Remember to select the option with the three dots on Eclipse and then give clean surefire colon report space site apply and run. The run may take a little while if it's the first time as Maven has to download all the plugins and also its dependencies. Once it's completed, refresh the target folder in your project. You will see that there are many folders created. Open the one that says site and then open the index.html with your browser. It opens up your project's homepage neatly created by Maven. Now under the project reports, navigate to Surefire report. This is where you can see the status of your JUnit tests, the number of tests, the successes, the failures. And if you also scroll down to the failure section and expand them, it shows the exact error as well. This comes in real handy in showing the reports to management and also in bug fixing. Congratulations, you have reached the end of the course. Hope the course was helpful to you in understanding JUnit and help you realize its full power. Remember, an application well tested is an application that runs longer and also runs better. Good luck and happy learning.